In the world of steam legends, Union Pacific's big boy rules the memory of railroad power. But what if America's strongest locomotive wasn't big boy at all? The Pennsylvania Railroad's Q2 produced nearly 8,000 horsepower, over 25% more than big boy, yet vanished so completely that not a single engine survived. How did the most powerful steam locomotive ever built become a forgotten casualty instead of an icon? This is the story few have ever heard, and it begins with the radical engineering gamble that changed everything. Drafting tables at the Pennsylvania Railroad's Altoona Works filled with blueprints that broke with decades of tradition. Instead of a single pair of massive cylinders, the Q2's designers split the engine's power between two independent sets, each with its own pair of cylinders and valve gear. Both sets were mounted on a single rigid frame, but the arrangement was anything but simple. Each cylinder measured 23 and 3 quarters inches in diameter with a 28 inch stroke, identical dimensions for both the front and rear engines. This meant the Q2 was not a compound or a typical articulated locomotive. It was a true duplex, two equal engines side by side, sharing one boiler and one purpose. The front engine powered the first group of four driving wheels, while the rear engine drove the next six driving wheels. Unlike the long, heavy rods of a conventional 2104 arrangement, each engine unit on the Q2 used much shorter and lighter connecting rods. This reduction in rod length and mass cut down on the pounding forces, what engineers called dynamic augment, that hammered the rails at high speed. Pennsylvania Railroad draftsmen believed that by dividing the work, they could push more horsepower through the rails without shaking the track to pieces. To further smooth the delivery of power, the engineers staggered the timing of each engine's cranks. Within each pair, the left and right driving wheels were set at 90 degrees, just like any American steam locomotive. But the two engine sets themselves were phased so their power strokes did not overlap, spreading the force around the wheel revolution. The result was a steadier, more continuous surge of torque closer in field to a four-cylinder automobile engine than the choppy rhythm of a two-cylinder locomotive. Every detail of the Q2's anatomy reflected this philosophy. Four separate sets of Walshart's valve gear, one for each cylinder, coordinated the movement of pistons and rods. The boiler, a giant pressure vessel spanning nearly the entire length of the frame, fed both engines at full pressure. At the rear, a Worthington feed water heater and a mechanical stoker kept the firebox supplied, ensuring the Q2 could maintain its record-breaking output mile after mile. On paper, the logic was sound. By splitting the power, the Q2 could deliver nearly 8,000 horsepower, more than any other rigid frame steam locomotive in history. Shorter rods meant less reciprocating mass, higher safe speeds, and reduced track damage. The twin engine arrangement promised smoother running and lower maintenance on individual parts, but every advantage came with a new layer of complexity. Twice the cylinders meant twice the moving parts, twice the valve gear, and twice the potential for something to go wrong. For the mechanical team at Altoona, the Q2 was both an achievement and a puzzle, a machine that could outmuscle anything on the rails if every piece worked in perfect harmony. The Q2's anatomy was a study in ambition, an attempt to rewrite the rules of steam power by dividing the strain across more hands. Yet beneath the surface, the split power approach introduced challenges that no amount of drafting room precision could fully control. As the Q2 thundered out of Altoona, it carried not just the hopes of its engineers, but the seeds of the struggles that would soon follow. On the shop floor, the Q2's blueprints revealed a machine that demanded as much caution as admiration. The engine's split power philosophy came with a price, weight, and complexity multiplied at every turn. Each of the four massive cylinders required its own set of Walshirt's valve gear, so where a conventional freight locomotive might need two assemblies, the Q2 needed four, each with its own rods, levers, and pins. Every moving part doubled, 
every joint a new point of inspection, every bearing another candidate for wear. The rigid frame, stretching nearly 123 feet from pilot to tender, forced all 10 driving wheels to act as one unyielding spine. This design left little room for forgiveness if the track beneath was less than perfect, or if conditions shifted suddenly. Inventory sheets from Altoona listed the Q2's parts count in the thousands. Beyond the main rods and crossheads, the duplex drive required twice the usual number of connecting rods, crank pins, and eccentric links. Each driver axle, whether part of the forward or rear engine, carried its own burden of force and friction. Lubrication points multiplied, and the schedule for routine maintenance grew longer with every added mechanism. Even the boiler, built to feed both sets of cylinders at full pressure, demanded reinforced stays and a more robust feed water system to keep up with the relentless appetite for steam. Shop planners eyed the diagrams with a mix of pride and anxiety. The Q2 promised unmatched power, but the sheer mass of components meant that every mile on the main line translated into more hours in the back shop. The duplication of valve gear alone meant twice the adjustments, twice the chance for misalignment, and twice the risk that a single oversight could sideline the entire locomotive. Each time the Q2 rolled out for a run, it did so with a mechanical complexity that no other rigid frame steam engine had ever carried. This was the hidden cost of the duplex dream. For every advantage on paper, shorter rods, balanced power, reduced hammer blow, there was a shadow in the form of increased upkeep and operational sensitivity. The rigid wheelbase, while essential for transmitting nearly 8,000 horsepower to the rails, gave the Q2 no room to adapt if the load shifted or the rails grew slick. As the locomotive's moving parts multiplied, so did the opportunities for trouble. The Q2's promise of smooth, continuous power came with a warning. Every extra joint, every duplicated assembly, could become a stress point the moment conditions strayed from ideal. In the pursuit of record-breaking performance, the Q2 carried not just the weight of its steel, but the burden of its own ambition. Throttle wide open. The Q2's four cylinders delivered a force that felt almost reckless beneath the cab floor. Engineers assigned to these locomotives spoke of a machine that could outpull anything if the rails could keep up. The duplex drive split power between two sets of drivers, but the rigid frame forced every wheel to fight for grip together. On dry rail, with a careful hand at the throttle, the Q2 moved freight with a kind of brute confidence. But as speed climbed, the line between control and chaos thinned. Engineers described a tension that built as the speedometer crept past 45, then 50 miles per hour. At these speeds, adhesion became fragile. Each engine unit, front and rear, could lose grip on its own. If one set slipped, it spun violently, sending a jolt through the entire locomotive. The shriek of steel on steel, wheels breaking loose, meant the Q2's power had overrun the rail's hold. Sometimes the front engine would lose traction while the rear kept pushing, or the opposite setting up a dangerous oscillation that could snap rods or destroy bearings in seconds. Field reports and mechanical logs from Altoona told the same story. Wheel slip became a real threat above 50, especially on damp rails or under heavy throttle. The Q2 could haul 125 loaded cars at 50 miles per hour, but any push for more speed risked violent loss of control. Unlike articulated engines which flexed between units, the Q2's rigid wheelbase offered no give. The whole locomotive would lurch as one, amplifying the slip and making recovery nearly impossible. Engineers learned to feather the throttle, listening for the first hint of a spin and backing off sometimes too late to avoid damage. One retired engineer remembered the strain of running a Q2 at speed. You could feel it in your hands, in the seat, in the rails. The power was there, but you had to respect it. If you got greedy, the engine would remind you who was really in charge. Every fast run became a test of nerve. 
the threat of wheel slip was constant, and the consequences severe, broken rods, ruined valve gear, or hours spent in the shop. Each incident added to the Q2's reputation as both marvel and menace. The same horsepower that set records in the test plant brought anxiety to the rails, and every slip meant more work back at Altoona. Maintenance foreman at Altoona kept detailed logs, and every entry for the Q2 seemed to confirm a troubling reality. The sheer number of moving parts, four cylinders, four sets of valve gear, and twice the usual rods and bearings meant that every inspection took longer, every repair demanded more hands, and every overhaul required specialized tools. Where a conventional J1-210-4 called for two valve gear setups and a straightforward checklist, the Q2 doubled the tally. Each new joint, pin, or bearing introduced another potential failure point, and every mile on the main line translated into more hours in the back shop. Man hours were how shop supervisors measured their days, and the Q2 was a relentless consumer. Routine maintenance that might take a team half a day on a J1 stretched into a full shift or more on the duplex. Lubrication alone became a logistical challenge, with crews crawling over the massive frame to reach dozens of grease points. Any misalignment in the complex valve gear could sideline the locomotive for days, and the rigid frame's demands meant that even minor track imperfections could lead to costly repairs. Inventory managers noted the steady drain on spare parts, extra rods, bearings, and valve components, and the need for mechanics trained to handle the Q2's unique systems. Budget officers in Philadelphia reviewed the numbers with growing unease. In the mid-1940s, diesel-electric locomotives were quietly rewriting the economics of railroad operations. Early reports from other lines showed that diesels could move the same tonnage with far less shop time. Industry-wide studies found that diesels slashed locomotive department labor by 70 to 90 percent compared to steam. For the Pennsylvania Railroad, that meant the Q2's maintenance burden was not just a technical inconvenience, it was a financial liability. Internal memos circulated between the mechanical and finance departments, spelling out the math in stark terms. A single diesel set could stay on the road for days with only brief checks at terminals while the Q2 demanded regular returns to the shop for inspection and adjustment. Water stops, ash handling, and boiler washes, all routine for steam, were simply erased from the diesel ledger. Even before factoring in fuel costs, the labor savings alone tipped the scales. The Q2's doubled complexity translated directly into doubled shop time, and as diesel rosters grew, the contrast became impossible to ignore. For every hour a Q2 spent in the back shop, a diesel spent that hour moving freight. The numbers told a clear story. Power on paper was no match for the relentless efficiency of diesel economics. As the maintenance logs grew thicker, the case for steam's future grew thinner. The Q2's promise of unmatched horsepower faded against a tide of cold, hard arithmetic. Pennsylvania Railroad's main line ran straight and level from Chicago to the East Coast, a corridor engineered for efficiency rather than spectacle. This was the Q2's domain, endless stretches of flat ground, gentle curves, and double-track arteries built to move freight with relentless regularity. While Western Railroad sent locomotives like the Union Pacific Big Boy up steep grades and through mountain passes, the Q2 worked in the shadows of routine, hauling coal and merchandise across the heartland. Pennsylvania Railroad operations planners assigned the Q2 to these flat, high-traffic routes for a reason. The locomotive's immense horsepower fit perfectly with the railroad's busiest lanes, where long trains needed steady, reliable muscle. Yet this assignment came with limits. Company policy capped freight speeds at 50 miles per hour, a rule shaped as much by tradition as by safety. No matter how much force the Q2 could muster, it was held in check by the timetable and the unyielding flatness beneath its wheels. The difference between east and west was stark. Out west, steam giants became legends. 
their struggles against gravity and weather immortalized in photographs and stories. Mountain railroading offered drama, summits, blizzards, and the spectacle of raw power overcoming nature. On the Pennsylvania Railroad, the Q2's victories were measured in tonnage moved and schedules kept. Not in dramatic climbs or cinematic vistas, its work was essential, but invisible. Lost in the daily rhythm of freight, moving between industrial cities. There were no mountain passes to conquer, no mythic moments to capture public attention. Publicity rarely singled out the Q2. Wartime posters and company brochures celebrated Pensy's modern fleet, but the Q2's unique design and restricted territory kept it out of the spotlight. The 50 miles per hour speed cap and flat geography meant its extra horsepower never translated into showmanship. For most, it was just another big engine, indistinguishable among black locomotives and brown boxcars. The Q2's stage was narrow, flat main lines, enforced speeds, and a culture of quiet efficiency. Its story played out away from cameras and crowds, its achievements buried in the routine, its legend muted by the very geography and policy that defined its career. Boardroom minutes from Philadelphia in 1949 recorded the first official withdrawal of a Q2 locomotive. The decision was not dramatic. No speeches, no commemorative photographs. It came down to a single line in the records, authorization granted to retire and dispose of one unit, number 6131. Over the next seven years, that same phrase would echo through the company's internal paperwork, each time erasing another engine from the roster. By 1951, the pace of withdrawal accelerated. Diesel orders filled the headlines, while the Q2's fate was reduced to a footnote in mechanical department summaries. Scrap contracts were signed with local yards in Altoona, Enola, and Conway. Invoices tracked the tonnage of steel, copper, and brass stripped from each engine, but never mentioned the horsepower that once thundered down the main line. No preservation committees formed, no museum curators lobbied for a Q2. The Pennsylvania Railroad's leadership saw these locomotives not as icons, but as costly experiments that had run their course. Internal correspondence shows a quiet consensus. Resources would be spent on standard power and new diesels, not on saving reminders of a failed gamble. The last Q2, number 6154, was stricken from the roster in 1956. Its boiler was cut apart before the year's end. All 26 Q2s vanished into scrap without ceremony. Not a single builder's plate, cab, or driving wheel was set aside for posterity. In less than a decade, the most powerful rigid frame steam locomotives ever built disappeared so completely that their existence became a rumor among younger railroaders. The board's decision was final and absolute. In the official ledgers, the Q2s became a line of negative numbers, assets written off, weight removed from the books, memory erased from the rails. Today, a locomotive that once broke records exists only in faded diagrams and scattered shop logs. As technology races forward, even groundbreaking power can vanish if it fails to capture the world's imagination. The Q2's fate is a reminder Innovation alone does not guarantee remembrance. What we choose to preserve shapes the legends and the limits of our collective memory. What stories will we allow to disappear next? Share your thoughts below.